What's up guys, welcome to another video brought to you by The Simple Engineer. Today we are going to be continuing our series with computer architecture and talking about the single cycle design. Now the single cycle data path is uh, a series of stages that execute sequentially uh, within the CPU where only one instruction can be executed at any given time or any given clock cycle. So, um, just hearing that definition, you're probably realizing that it's a, a pretty inefficient way of, of carrying out a, a, a system, a CPU system, and the reason being is because it's so slow. However, the advantage is that it's a very simple implementation. And we're going to look at all the different stages that a single cycle data path goes through. So we have five stages, and the first is the instruction fetch stage. We have the IF stage, and this is the instruction fetch. And what this does is the CPU says, okay, we are going to bring in some arbitrary instruction. We don't know what it is yet. And if possible, we can bring it in from the cache, but that doesn't always work. And after we bring this in, we are going to increment the PC counter by four bytes. And the incrementation of this PC counter by four bytes allows the CPU to prepare itself after the first cycle is complete to continue the next cycle. So that's what goes on in this first stage. The second stage is the ID stage, the instruction decode stage. And when we have this arbitrary instruction brought in, we need to know what it is. And the CPU will read in the associated opcode and determine, so we have read op code to determine instruction, to determine instruction. And the reason that this is so helpful is because the next stage is the EX stage and this is the execution. This is this is the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit. And this is what is going to perform the actual computation part of the single cycle data path. And the ALU, um, if you guys are familiar, we had we would have something that looks like this. And it takes in, you know, like this T0 operand and T1 operand. And it's going to figure out, this is the zero output, and this is the output. And it needs to figure out what this is, but it's not going to know without the, the op code. And you have this ALU op code here that tells it what it's going to do. Is it going to add? Is it going to subtract? And it's going to say, oh, okay, we have an add op code in here, so we're going to take T0 and we're going to say plus T1 and the output is going to come out of this stage here. And that is what is essentially going on at a very high level for this ALU. So this is this is the computation. Computation. Okay, next uh, we have the mem stage, which is the actual memory access. And something to note is that this is only really going to get utilized with the load and store word instructions. So if you're loading a word from the memory or you're storing a word into memory, that is when you're going to utilize this mem stage. Otherwise, when you're actually implementing this single cycle data path, you're going to skip over this. It's going to execute very, very quickly because you're not actually loading or storing data within the RAM. And that brings us to the final stage, which is the WB, which is the write back. And this is where you would store the output data into some register. And uh, back to this example up here, we would get some output, let's say this equals five. We would take this integer five and if we were storing this into say S1, we would take five in the write back stage and store this into some S1 register. And that's what would happen in this stage here. <clears throat> so there's something that you need to realize and that's every instruction takes one clock cycle. Even though 
some individual instruction may complete in a variable amount of time, the entire process is still going to take one clock cycle. Now, with that being said, if we have an add instruction and we have a load word instruction and we have a subtract instruction, we have XOR, and we go ahead and start analyzing these times and we say, okay, add takes uh, 300 nanoseconds, load word takes 800 nanoseconds, uh, sub takes 400 nanoseconds, and XOR takes uh, 200 nanoseconds. We need to make sure that we're making the clock period um, able to do all of these things. And because it's a fixed time, a fixed period, because it's a single cycle, we have to pick the slowest instruction as our clock period. So just note that the slowest instruction in this case would be the 800 nanoseconds associated with load word, and that would be our clock period for the single cycle design. Okay, so uh, let's take a quick look at uh, what would be going on in the actual CPU at a lower level. And uh, so we talked about the stages. We said there's five stages, and the first one is to fetch the instruction from the memory. And that's what would go on right here. We would fetch the instruction, okay, and that tells the processor, okay, we need to now decode this. Um, but in addition to that, like I said, how we increment the PC counter, we have PC here, and this is going into the add, and then we increase whatever PC is by four bytes and it goes through this stage and then it outputs and then it comes back to remember what that number is. So it's going to continuously increment PC equals PC plus four and that prepares the CPU to do another instruction. So we fetch this. The fetch goes into this register and the register says okay what do we got here if okay we have a we have some instruction i'm going to decode it this is the id stage the register is responsible for decoding this data and the register says to the alu okay we now have this this operation this instruction and let's just say it's an add instruction and it, it, it outputs it and tells the alu some some op code brings us to the ex stage EX. We're going to now execute the computation within the central processor. This this computation is going to say, okay, are we going to uh, write this data? No, we're not storing the data into the random access memory. We're not loading any data from the random access memory. We would if the opcode was associated with LW or SW, but it's not. It's just a basic add instruction. So we're going to go ahead and bypass that, go around, and we have this write back and this is the last stage we have the write back stage and this would store the output of this ALU into some register it finalizes it and let's just say it's stored into S1 and then we're saying okay we're good now we're going to go back the cycle's been complete that was one clock cycle and looking at this, you can see how inefficient that would be. We have to wait every single step until anything else can complete. And the more efficient way is, okay, this instruction's been read in, let's go to read instruction, but while we're here, maybe let's start to do another fetch, and then we can start doing things you know, in parallel. We can do this multi-cycle design. And that's what brings us to pipelining. That's a multi-cycle design implementation. And we're not going to discuss that too much in this video, but I will talk about the pros and cons of each. And that's what we'll go ahead and take a look at. Uh, what I wanna do is actually do a, a real world example to show why things like this are useful. If we have, let's say we are building a car and we need to build the frame and let's say each of these take one hour to do. We wanna build the frame, we wanna install the parts and we wanna paint the car. 
And if each of these steps takes an hour, then we've successfully built a car in three hours. Okay, but we aren't going to start installing the parts until the frame's built, and we're not going to start painting until the car parts are installed. And the thing is, is if we were building six cars times three hours a piece, that takes 18 hours. But we would not, we would say we're going to build, install, paint, and then we're going to build, install, paint, and you see that we're not even going to start building the second car until the first car's paint is done. But what if we have a crew of men that can do all of this simultaneously? And that's why you start doing pipelining. Pipelining improves the performance. You can do multiple things, multiple instructions within a single clock cycle. So if we have station one, station one, and we have station two, station three we have three stations set up and these are all referring to build install and paint okay well what if station one is responsible for building the frame we have build 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 and station two is gonna say okay we're responsible for uh, installing the parts well obviously we can't install the parts until the frames built so we'll say install 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 and this guy is going to say okay after build is done we're going to install the parts after build is done we'll install the parts okay and then station three we're going to paint well we can't start painting until the parts are installed so we're going to paint here and then we're going to paint here and we're going to paint here and this is going to finish here and here and here so looking at the above example where you're not even going to start building until the first paint is done that's totally different here we're going to start painting simultaneously we're painting two cars while still you know installing parts and it's a much more efficient process so now instead of building one car in three hours we can build one car per one hour one car per one hour is going to be our new conversion rate because we can start doing things multiple times at once. This is a three times improvement. This is three times faster. And when you have instructions in the processor that are executing sequentially, it's very slow. So you want to start doing adding and subtracting and loading words simultaneously to do these simultaneous computations to make things much faster. And that brings us to um, you know the the advantage of a multi-cycle design and the disadvantage of a single cycle design so that really uh, is just a, a basic walkthrough and um, just to do an overview um, just bring up a new sheet here kind of talk about an overview of things to remember okay so first off this is a simple design. It's very simple. There's no hazards that you'll run into. Secondly, it's inefficient. Inefficient from a performance standpoint. And that's because a clock cycle time must be chosen such that the longest instruction can be executed in one clock cycle. And that brought us to that previous example, how load word took the longest time. Well, that would be the longest instruction that we would set as the clock rate. That would be the clock cycle time. It would be that 800 nanoseconds. Um, so it makes shorter instructions execute in one unnecessarily long cycle. So when we had load word and that took 800 nanoseconds, but our XOR only took 200 nanoseconds, we still have a fixed clock cycle time and it's this 800 nanoseconds and this guy's like okay that sucks because now I've already executed my 200 nanoseconds but I'm just gonna wait around until I hit 800 nanoseconds because this load word is taking up so much time and it has to be a fixed rate and accommodate for these huge times so it kinda just sits idle until it hits this final clock stage and that can be very slow. That's what makes this so inefficient. 
Um, additionally, there's no resource in the design that may be used more than once per instruction. So some resources will be duplicated. Uh, once again, that's very inefficient because you have you know, one, uh, one instruction executing at a time. Uh, because of that, and this is at a, a, a lower level of CPU design, but because of that, you have two memories, instruction and data, and you have two additional adders. And uh, that's just adding more unnecessary hardware to your design. Okay, guys, well, that just uh, discusses the very basic introduction to a single cycle design, how it works. Um, just a brief example. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment, and I will be happy to help.